Today on The Topping Show, Lori Lightfoot is the first Chicago mayor to lose re-election in 40 years, Elon reveals a master plan 3, Ford patents repossession technology, Tesla is going to open a factory in Mexico, and Gen Z may be here to save stick shifts. All of that and much, much more on The Topping Show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Today's episode of The Topping Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN and Topping Technologies. ExpressVPN protects your online data, and Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. If you need help for a business owner or an IT leader, especially in Texas, you can reach them at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Jumping into the business part of the podcast, Elon is revealing or revealed his master plan three. This was during an invest, investor day event that he hosted in Austin recently. The plan is for a total switch to EV and 10 trillion in spending to create a quote unquote sustainable energy future. The cost is going to cover or partially going to cover the mining and refining of raw materials in addition to developing vehicle batteries and storage calls for vast energy storage of 20, 240,000 gigawatt hours and a sustainable production occurring on 0.2% of the Earth's land area. So it kind of gives you an insight of what Elon's long-term goals are. His first master plan was announced in 2006. That's when he called for Tesla's goal of having a wide range of EV vehicles. He certainly knocked that out of the park. They are 100% EV, of course, and they're just killing it in terms of, in the US, they have over 50% of market share of EV vehicle productions. Granted, the major players of the automotive or traditional major players are catching up and starting to develop their EV platforms more as well. And his second master plan a couple years back, that was to focus on battery energy storage systems and self-driving capabilities. It's debatable how much self-driving their cars or vehicles are. It's kind of a legal gray area. There's certain definitions and what you are or not supposed to be doing. But they certainly have some capabilities that hint towards that technology and in certain instances can. I think there's a big difference between that and autonomous driving perhaps. A lot of people are getting in the weeds and about trying to define which is which, but their battery exponentially has been improved as well. Going on to Tesla opening a factory in Mexico, this will be the first factory in the country and Mexico's president recently confirmed it will be in Monterey, Mexico. It will create 6,000 jobs and Elon is also going to examine if that would be a prime place to build Tesla batteries, maybe somewhere in the middle of the country as well. This is following suit of other major manufacturers who are setting up their EV factories in Mexico, including General Motors, Ford, and BMW. And it's not too surprising since Mexico has a pretty exceptional long-term relationship with the automotive community and provide a pretty good ROI with, I believe, GM first entered there majorly in perhaps the 80s for a lot of their vehicle production. So the country has a lot of experience with the vehicles. Now they're tra- transitioning to EV, and a lot of these businesses, including Tesla, BMW, they're noting that part of the reason they're going to build, build a big factory there is because the country of Mexico and the people there are increasing their demand in EV. So that's becoming a greater market for that technology and for those vehicles, as many of those areas of the country are trying to get away from fossil fuels. So the market's definitely growing down there as well. In terms of headcount decrease, that trend is continuing with major companies laying people off. Specifically, I noticed that Eventbrite was reducing a headcount and Eventbrite being one of the largest online platforms for basically generating tickets for an event. My company, Top Technologies, uses them for events that we host. And it's pretty convenient. You just set up a page where you have a registration. You can choose how many tickets to give out. You can customize the answers for how much data you want in terms of maybe you want a participant's, you know, corp- not only their corporate evil, but maybe you want their job title, the company name, so it's very customizable. They're going to reduce the headcount specifically by 8%. Now, the article on LinkedIn didn't note what that means, and I'm all about the numbers, so I quantify everything. So I looked at LinkedIn employees on Eventbrite. Now, granted, there's a lot of additional employees who don't have a profile, but so this is a conservative estimate. So the people on LinkedIn who claim to have their employment place be Eventbrite, so their account is linked to it, that is 1,173 employees. So roughly translated to that 8% reduce, reduction in headcount, it's going to account or come out to about 94 employees. In terms of the relocation, they're relocating 30% of the roles to India as well as Spain, with Eventbrite being headquartered in San Francisco. 
I'm not at all shocked. Those are two, especially India, that's one of the top countries for development. And we have an online website. It's a lot of R&D, a lot of development for it. So I'm not too shocked about that. In terms of politics and Eventbrite, they are a little biased against conservatives. Specifically, they also are against guns. If you have, and it's a little frustrating because I wanted to showcase some maybe specific high-end firearms you're having for a trap shooting event or something like that. And they actually will instantly kill your Eventbrite registration page if you have a picture of a firearm. And then more recently I found out you can't even have a firearm accessory such as a self-loading, like a little, little self-loading device or a magazine or even a pistol grip. Because a while back we were raffling those items off as door prizes and they immediately shut that down. And in all fairness, I did appreciate the fact that they specified why. So unfortunately we had to go back and alter those pictures and remove them. As opposed to some of these other big tech companies where you have no idea why you were censored and you'll never get back on the platform because they don't tell you how. So it's, it's a little... Obviously very frustrating for a lot of folks. They also censored a couple of film, independent films and documentaries that try to use that platform and they immediately shut those down as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that company goes. They, they don't have a monopoly, but in terms of whether the product that they offer, they are the industry leader for that category. They're not like a ticket master, which is more for concerts and I would argue bigger, more professional. I see Eventbrite, a lot of people, a lot of small businesses, a lot of a lot of organizations use that and it's a little bit easier to use. And I know most people just have the free ticket, but they do have the option where you could charge and there's up, of course there's extra features you can pay for. And I'm not too surprised. So it'd be interesting to see how that company continues to evolve as the reduction of headcount spreads throughout the industries. Going on to car debt, which I almost debate if this is a culture thing, because it is happening a lot in the United States. So car debt is skyrocketing. And back when I was leaving the automotive industry years ago, I mean, at that time, they were trying to push out 72-month loans, which, for those who aren't the best at math, that's six years for a vehicle. And I'm not a financial advisor, but I don't think that's, I don't think that's wise, a oh, wise fiscal plan. Depending on what your income is, there's a debate of should you just lease a car and not have to worry about the maintenance and all that kind of stuff, or catastrophic failure since it's not tied to yours. Some people say it's best to just pay all cash and you own it for life. But to extend that type of loan out so long, one of the biggest primary concerns that I bring up and many others do is the vehicle might break. And now we've gotten to the point now, it's not too uncommon to hear 100 month loans. It's frankly getting out of hand, especially when you look at vehicle reliability, depending on the brand you're looking at. One of the most dangerous situations fiscally you can do is pay for a vehicle with a very big loan. So you're paying a lot of money every month and you're not going to pay it off in, you know, six, seven, ten years. If that breaks, you still have to pay that and you have to get another vehicle. So it's, it is very concerning. Now, more specifically getting to the details, the payment was a little more in terms of the uh, default rates. They're a little bit more than 6% of subprime R loans are defaulting with at least 60 days late. This is in December of 2022. Although 6% might sound like not sound like a lot to many people, when you translate to that to the number of users, it's pretty darn big. And there's a lot of companies banking on that. No pun intended. The banks are putting out loans for that. Now, I couldn't find any information, <clears throat> excuse me, on the actual quantified number of people, unfortunately. I looked at a couple of articles and they just kept saying that 6%. But they did note that that 6% is a greater number than the defaults that were occurring during the 2008-2009 recession. And another one of the really bad things about COVID in terms of commerce and people be, being put between a rock and a hard place, there are mainly dealers that reported to Bloomberg News that there are a great increase in the number of people who are carrying as much as $10,000 in negative equity. And rudimentarily speaking, negative equity means you owe more than what your car is worth. And a lot of those folks, maybe you got in a car accident or you just, you had to get a vehicle and a lot, of those, a lot of the dealerships had quote unquote uh, market adjustments, which is just partially disgusting because I remember going to a Honda dealership and seeing a Honda Civic SI marked up. So you had the base price of about maybe 26000 and they had a line item for $10,000 for a market adjustment. I think the Civic Type R 
is like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars market adjustment. That's on top of the MSRP. And for those not in the automotive industry or maybe not have a lot of background, selling a car at MSRP provides you with a great deal of profit because you also have the not only on the vehicle, but then of course you have the back end with the financing, the accessories. And it's one of those instances where pre-COVID dealerships all over the country would give incentives. So paying MSRP or manufacturer suggest, the manufacturer suggested retail price was outrageous. No one would ever do that. It was maybe one or two rare boutique models or vehicles where that might be commonplace. But in terms of the whole industry trend, no one was paying that because it was a joke to most people because you had such a high volume of cars and trucks for sale. And then with COVID, it was a little while during when COVID first started, you can get car for dirt cheap because no one was buying cars. And then all of a sudden people were buying them and then the supply chain was just completely blown away. So you had very little new cars hitting the lots. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. I'm, it's also kind of a precarious situation where there's less and less cheap cars being made in terms of, I say cheap, some might say affordable, but the average price of the car keeps going up every year. And one of the most ironic things is the Ford F-150. That used to be a cheap, and the origin of a truck, the concept was a cheap working vehicle. They were cheaper than cars when they first came out. And now it's one of the most profitable line items for automotive companies. And the price goes up and up and up. I, between 2022 and 2023, the F-150, the base price went up by about $4,000. And I mean, that's a lot of money and that's on top of what you're already paying. And granted, it's what Ford does best, but still, it is it's getting, again, I know it's a cliche political thing to say, but middle America is always getting squeezed tight and it's just, it's, it's getting rougher and rougher. And speaking of Ford, Ford recently filed patents. They filed them in 2021, but they're being released now or coming to light now. And they filed patents for, quote unquote, systems and methods to repossess a vehicle. And then if you go down into the details of what are a couple of examples of those technologies, it can range anywhere from being able to remotely control the climate control, heated seats. It could be anything from disabling the performance of the vehicle so it can't go over the certain uh, miles per hour. And it could actually completely kill the vehicle in terms of making it immobile. And that is another astonishing, interesting development in the automotive industry because these companies know the defaults are coming. They're already here. So they're wondering how can we make our lives a little bit easier? Uh, a few months back, Tesla, there were some rumors with Elon where they said, you know, reportedly they believe someday they'll get to the point where Tesla, if they want to, they just turn on their computer or more accurately, probably these days, a smartphone, click a button. And if you're behind your payments, the car just comes back to Tesla because by that time they'll be fully, truly self-driving autonomous and the vehicle just come back. And it goes back to that old theory, and it's not really a conspiracy anymore because it's been said by so many people in power as a long-term goal of humanity in terms of you'll own nothing and be happy. And a lot of people are saying there's certain studies that say the less possessions you have, the happier you are. And everything in, our, in especially in the United States, is going to a subscription model. That's a very common for most businesses these days to at least offer it, if not exclusively have that. And Ford having these types of technologies also reminds me of the Tesla and the softwares where you really don't own the vehicle, just like your smartphone. You own the lithium battery inside, you know, the physical part, but these pieces of equipment are utterly useless without the software. That's what makes them work. And kind of another ADHD thought, it'll be interesting to see how that translates into right to repair laws, which are thankfully being introduced with a lot of bipartisan support, which is a nice way, which I think is a way that maybe we could bring some people together. And this is a heavy automotive section. There's a lot of automotive news this week. Now, I normally give a lot of hoots and hollers about Gen Z, but there's some good news. So I, I never knew these terms. I, I need to squint to the screen. So Zoomers and Zillennials might be here to save me on transmission. And if they do, I will give them a solid pat on the back or accolades in spades, because that is one of the best driving experiences you could have. I always joke, if I was in charge of the automotive company, you would only have stick shifts. And I argue you'd be less accidents because you can't text and drive if your one hand is always on the stick shift or you don't want to wear out the clutch. So when you're shifting, your hand's got to be ready to grab that knob, pressing that third pedal, make that adjustment. Now, the manual transmission sales went up by 1.2% 1. 1. according to a, a JD Power article. 
and auto trader saw a 13% rise in page visits from the stick shift. And one of the reasons I loved auto trader as a kid and spent so many hours looking at all those neat cars on there is because unlike competitors, I believe at the time it was not an option on cars.com, big competitor of auto trader cars.com. You could not filter by stick shifts. And as a kid, I knew if I ever got, when I bought my car, it will have a stick shift. That's not even a question. It will have one. And I'm proud to say my first car had a stick shift and my second car was a stick shift. I love it. I wouldn't have it any other way. And it's also good to see some of the manufacturers really becoming ambassadors for this idea, the ideal of the stick shift and really keeping the dream alive. So, excuse me, Mazda reintroduced a six speed in several of their vehicle lineups, or sorry, a Mini. Mazda has a couple as well. But Mini also opened a driving school to teach you stick shifts which is one of the best things BMW has ever done, in my opinion. BMW being the parent company who bought out Mini several years ago during the debacle of Land Rover, Range Rover acquisition. They got rid of that, but they kept the Mini. So if you saw the Italian job and quote unquote the newer Mini, it was manufactured with the BMW ownership. So they opened up a driving school. Acura brought back a stick shift for the first time since 2015. Granted, it's just a, it is a dressed up Honda Civic, but it's still great to see that option for that premium brand. So you're getting a couple of nice amenities and even, even more fascinating, more than half the stick shift Integra buyers were aged between 18 and 46. And then going on to speaking of Mazda or kind of going back to Mazda, they noted that 25% of those who bought a manual Miata in 2022 were between 18 and 35, which in terms of brand support, Mazda always knocks out of the park with the Miata. I would argue every Miata should be a stick shift as they're meant to be driven as intended as a fun, unique experience. They actually still service cars to this day in terms of if you need a part for 91 Mazda Miata, they'll get you it. And they also support the amateur racing community, get people interested in the sport of on roads. So they're one of the best manufacturers, I believe, in addition to Toyota, who also has a partnership with NASA, where if you buy a new Supra or GRE6, those are the two of their their sport cars, you get a free one-year membership to NASA Texas, uh, or sorry, I believe it's just NASA. I'm I'm part of the Texas division, which is the North America Track Association. Think of it like a club, and you go there, you can learn how to race. And Toyota actually has a school where they teach you. Great for the hobby and the sport. And kind of the trend of all the, all the cars in 2019, there are over there are uh, 69 models that you could buy the stick shift. In 2022, there's only 43. So it'd be great if we could see the, that those numbers go back up as we see. I wouldn't say it's a resurgence because it's only it's it is 1.2 percent increase in sales of manuals, but I think automotive companies will also know to boutique to those buyers, and I hope they give that option to everyone. Even if you don't, even if you know 75 percent of vehicle is going to be an automatic and it's quote unquote just 25, that's going to be great brand loyalty. That's one of the reasons everyone still loves Porsche. They're the only supercar or really performance car high end that gives you that freedom, that option to choose a stick shift. Unlike everyone who else who's long abandoned the beautiful, beautiful ideals of a three pedal machine. Now going on to politics, the GOP pushed through a ban on TikTok, specifically the Republicans on the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, rammed, quote unquote, rammed through a bill that could ban TikTok on all mobile devices in the, in the U.S. And Democrats saying they do not want that. And it, you know, interestingly enough, Eric Swalwell, another Democrat college member, he actually selected the Chinese spy for a couple of years, interestingly enough. And the vote was 24 to 16 with all Democrats voting against it. I don't know if Republicans should be pushing this because specifically the legislation will give the president new ability to ban foreign owned apps and require sanctions on companies with ties to TikTok and other Chinese apps. So I always tell people in terms of politics, no matter how much power you think you're giving yourself, it will eventually be given to your opponent. I mean, politics is fluid. You have different people coming in and out um, of most areas of politics where you're flipping between Democrats and Republicans. And it's interesting that the, the GOP wants to do this now and they don't have the presidency. So even if they give this power, Biden might just veto their idea completely or just say he doesn't care about TikTok. And it's one of those things where you always have to be careful about giving one man too much power it's it's always a double-edged sword. That's why a lot of people throughout history, you just got to warn folks, be like, never forget the shoe will be on the other foot. So you always want some balance to the equation. Now, other sad or pathetic politics in terms of the U.S. 
the U.S. is now near $31.5 trillion in debt. And you can blame that to everyone in the, everyone in the, in the whole political realm. Very, there's like one or two people in politics who really promulgate that we should be spending less and should be actually maybe decrease that to actually make a profit. There was a time where the U.S. government had a surplus, but every year they just spend more and more and more. And you're digging the hole deeper and deeper and deeper. So Congress is currently debating if they should raise the debt ceiling, which if you're new to politics, the debt ceiling would raise the amount of money that the U.S. can borrow. Think of it as extending your credit card. And appropriately for that analogy, your credit card is overdue by a lot, but you still want to get more credit extended. No rational bank would, would do that. It boggles the mind. Now, Republicans are arguing that the Fed's should cut spending in order to increase the debt ceiling. So they're saying, if you cut some spending, we will increase that, which makes sense. However, you always remember, quantify everything. There's no specific areas to be cut yet. So Republicans are saying, hey, you need to cut this. We don't care where you cut it necessarily from, but they probably should have some suggestions. But that also is a point of contention because there's separate things that Republicans want to fund and Democrats want to fund. But I feel like there's a couple of things, hopefully we could team up on say, hey, we can cut this. This doesn't make sense for the government to do. Why are we spending billions and trillions of dollars on you know, line items X, Y, and Z? You know, let's just both agree, hey, we don't need that. The private sector can do it. Maybe that's, that's not the government's job. And we could decrease that debt because eventually someone's going to call on that debt. It's just a matter of time. The U.S., there's still a lot of foreign investments because a lot of countries are in debt. And historically, the U.S. has been the best bet in terms of a return on investment but we'll see it's a pretty precarious situation now historically speaking Lori Lightfoot loses the Chicago re-election she is the mayor or was the mayor of Chicago which has been Democrat for just a couple of years in terms of background of the city of Chicago the last Republican mayor was William Hale Thompson that's an old sounding name and you would be right to think that because he was mayor from 1915 to 1923 and then in 1927 to 1931. So that was the last time Democrats had, or sorry, um, Republicans had a mayor in the city of Chicago. Probably need to work on their marketing among, among many other things, but you get what you vote for. That's what the city wants. Now, interestingly enough, she won in 2019 with overwhelming majority. She actually won every single district. People really wanted her to be elected. And there's a lot of support around that. And now she's going to be the first one-year mayor in more than 40 years. That is unprecedented. 40 years. So recently, or a couple days ago, Paul Vallis and Brandon John beat her, and they will advance to a runoff. In the recent uh, vote, they received 33.7% and 20.3% of the votes sequentially Paul getting 33.7 and they will have a face off in April. Now, Lori came into office promising that she would be tough on crime and she had background working with the police. So that's one of the reasons everyone gave her a lot of support. And it didn't really work at all to say the least. Crime increased. She also bumped heads with the police unions because with the vax mandates and interestingly enough, she'd only allow interviews based on someone's race. Going to the crime, it's gotten so bad, they're losing some of the biggest businesses in, businesses in the United States. Which, when it comes to stability of a city and a community, jobs are pretty darn important. It's the cornerstone. It's why companies and cities will work together where they'll incentivize the business to move there. They don't have to pay taxes for 15 years because... They're bringing 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 jobs to the area, and all those people are contributing. So with Chicago, they actually lost the headquarters so they're of Boeing, Caterpillar, Citadel, and Chicago Bears. Boeing being one of the largest aerospace companies in history, they're relocating to Virginia. Caterpillar moved actually to Texas over in Irving. And Citadel, a big financial, they moved to Miami. And Arlington Bears, or sorry, so the Chicago Bears moving to Arlington, Illinois. There are several reasons, but, and then Tyson Foods, one of the largest food producers in the U.S., they're moving their Chicago office. That's no longer a thing. They relocated employees to their other remote offices and also their headquarters. And a lot of these companies, because 
if you're a big company, you have to have some political finesse. They're not coming out and saying, oh no, we're not saying it's because of increase in crime and our employees can't safely get to work and also the burdens and taxes during an economic downturn, which is stretching, stretching companies to their limit. However, Citadel did specifically say it was due to Chicago crime, which has been in a problem for quite some time. And it's a trend that can't be easily turned around. It's a lot to do with culture, but it's also, it's a catch-22 because you have to create jobs, culture, well-being, and you have to have a community that looks out for each other. If you had all the money in the world, it might not even necessarily fix the problem because it's not just a money thing. Personally, if I was in charge or if I was mayor for a day, I would double the police force, have them patrol the high crime neighborhoods, let people know you will not be a repeat offender. You're going to jail. Break the law. You can have employees and employers fly them in for wherever the headquarters be like, hey, we're turning this neighborhood around. We need your help. Employers go to the high schools, say, hey, kids, well, um, depending on how old they are, here's the deal we have. We'll pay for your college if you work for us for four to six years. Easy, I mean, free college, that great deal. And that would create jobs. Having all the police and the increased actual prosecution of crime would also incentivize the businesses to not leave. So there are actually drug stores and pharmacies leaving Chicago as well. Not the headquarters, but all of these stores leaving because of the crime. So this problem is getting worse and worse and worse. But if you do those two things, just more police, prosecute crime, and then work with the businesses so the businesses know the area is safe. Because businesses want safeness for their employees and their customers and their brand. So if you, again, I'm not a politician, but shoot, those seem like good places to start. So it'll be interesting to see how that the runoff goes and what the new mayor might bring to the equation. Now, going on to the business blunder of the week, which I debate is really a blunder because it goes against some of my beliefs as free, free speech. Elon Musk got in some hot water for telling the truth about COVID. He claims to be a speech, a free speech absolute, absolutist. However, he did refuse to allow Alex Jones back on Twitter. And Elon's response is pretty emotional, talking about how Alex Jones was trying to profit off the death of children. This was because of the Sandy Hook controversy where Alex Jones had a conspiracy, thinking it was crisis actors being the parents and the government trying to manufacture it to increase their initiatives on gun confiscation. So Elon had a very emotional response to that. And I mean, Alex Jones, I think, covered the, he covered the topic for less than 30 minutes total. He's been sued for $1.5 billion. And it's one of those things where, again, I don't, it's an old school saying that liberals used to say is, and conservatives, everyone used to say, I might not believe in what you say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. So Elon kind of falls short on that metric. He let a lot of people back on, which is great because more perspectives, more views, the better. Well, the worst thing you'd have is an echo chamber because you don't grow, you don't learn. It's just an affirmation of your current beliefs. And it's more fun, when you, more fun when, you have, when you have different perspectives. You can learn a little bit. And one of my favorite things to do is, you know, with friends and people that you can actually sit down and have a conversation with, just having a fun little debate of, you know, learning their ideals, you know, where, they, where does their perspective come from? And, you know, see if you might learn a thing or two. Now, Elon is a little hot water because he's been talking a little bit about COVID. And spoiler alert, it didn't come from a chicken. Or where was it? Not a chicken. It was something even dumber than that. But there's more and more evidence saying that it came from a lab, um, obviously in Wuhan. So it wasn't from the soup. Bat soup. I almost forget. It was such an obscure... It was such an unbelievable story, I forgot. That was hard to forget with all, all the people saying it was real. So Elon's been saying how that's not really true. And even the U.S. government is trying to release, is release, releasing documents saying, oh, yeah, we kind of knew it was from a lab. Now, Elon has a huge factory in China. So he's bringing to light an issue where it, um, it came from China. They developed it. They made it. We actually paid for it. Um, but the Chinese-owned state... Uh, Global Times, and they actually warned Elon, don't bite the hand that feeds. And I mean, the government owns that newspaper. They're t they're working hand in hand. They know what they're saying. So and is it, interestingly enough, he's saying all these things on Twitter, but you can't use Twitter in China. It's blocked. So the only way you can use Twitter in China is if you have a virtual private net network, also known as VPN, also sponsored by ExpressVPN. 
So you're not even technically supposed to access it in China, but China still knows people use it on a daily basis. If they want to make sure they're in control of the narrative. But Elon's putting a lot at risk from his perspective or the perspective of him being the CEO of Tesla. China was one of the largest markets in the world, and they have a factory there, and they're increasing production. So I might not necessarily agree with this being a business blunder because I I believe the truth should always be brought to light, and more free speech the better. But in terms of the Tesla perspective, is a little bit of a blunder, kind of calling those things out when you have such a big factory there. So, given the amount of money he's invested in China, how much they work together, it, it's probably going to let it slide because I mean, he brings a lot of value, a lot of jobs, a lot of investments to the country. But it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a business blunder, unfortunately. I wish it wasn't. But that was the main one I could find for the day. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. If you'd like to see more content like this, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your coworkers. Heck, tell your any enemies, tell anyone. Just stay safe and fight the good fight.